Hello everyone and welcome to the Think JSAL webinar series brought to you by the Office for Strategic Engagement. Today we are pleased to present a distinguished speaker. This session is unclassified and will be recorded and posted to the JSAL network. Please keep in mind that the views and opinions expressed by all participants do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, or U.S. SOCOM. If you have questions after this session, please email us at thinkjsal at jsal.edu. So today for JSAL Next, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Ambassador Larry Butler, who has devoted over four decades as an American and international diplomat. He has been involved in things from the Dayton Accords to the front lines in Northern Ireland, the Middle East and Afghanistan. So he's had his share of conflict prevention and or deterrence and crisis management conflict prevention. So we're really happy to have him today. He spent a long time in the Balkans so to discuss some of the issues in the Balkans Next project, we're going to ask Ambassador Butler to talk a little bit about what kind of work he did during his time as a diplomat and what kind of things he's doing now to help the U.S. military better engage and the U.S. government itself better engage in the region. So it does not, like they say, blow up because several people have told me now, Ambassador, that the Balkans has again become kind of a powder keg. It's been a while since I've been in the region, probably 2019 was the last time. Um, and I know since the first time I was there in the early 90s that it's changed quite a bit, but as we know, a lot of things stay the same. So I, I'd really like to hear about some of the experiences you had at the beginning of your career. And now as you see the changes or the beginning of your time in the Balkans, let me be more specific. <laughs> And some of the things you're seeing now that have changed and some of the challenges that may still remain. Uh, great, listen, it's, it's uh, fantastic to, uh, to be back with you and, uh, you know, and sharing some of my experiences. And you've asked a loaded question, but you, you, you knew that when you asked me to, to come on here. Uh, I started in the Balkans. It was my third assignment in the Foreign Service. You know, I, I, had, I had spent two years in, in Finland, kind of between the front lines of the Cold War. And then I escaped to you know the sunny sunny skies of Brazil for two years, uh, uh, which was which I enjoyed you know sort of running consulates and reporting on coca production, co coca as in coca as in as in chocolate production, uh, and not really involved. And so I got to Bulgaria in 1982, and it was the People's Republic of Bulgaria, often nicknamed the 16th Republic of the Soviet Union. It was you know when it rained in Moscow, the joke was. Umbrellas opened in Bulgaria and had a reputation uh, for harboring international terrorists, uh, and they were they were the proxies for the Soviets to go do dirty work when when the, the Soviets didn't want to have their own people do it. You know, Bulgarians ha you know happily did it, and, and there is I, I am guilty of of doing what I then spend the rest of my career trying to undo, which was to light the match of ethnic conflict. It may, may sound you know, a little bit surprising. And my partner in crime at the time uh, was an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel uh, by the name of Michael Hayden. You, you've probably heard the name. I've heard of him, yes. <laughs> he, he, he went on to you know, bigger, better, and uh, more important things than I ever, ever aspired to. But you know, he had his job was you know, to spot uh, you know, Warsaw Pact Soviet uh, weaponry you know, in, in Bulgaria, you know, reported everything there as part of you know, you know, what defense attaches do. And at the time, this was in 1984, 85, my job was to report on stories that Bulgaria, that Bulgaria was forcibly assimilating this ethnic Turkish population, and it wasn't going well. And it was a harbinger of what was going to come with the breakup of Yugoslavia. I didn't know it at the time. Uh, one of my other partners in crime uh, was somebody at the Yugoslav embassy, uh, who turned out to be a Macedonian, and this is kind of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm adumbrating, foreshadowing what would happen when I would end up as the American ambassador in what is now North Macedonia. And he and the Turkish embassy were feeding me inside scoop about where I should go to go find the worst atrocities the, the communist uh, Bulgarians were, were doing to their ethnic Turkish minority. Uh, and we were quite successful. Uh, we, we, we got there, we, you know, we got the goods, we got the pictures, we exposed them, we got press. 
And you know, oddly enough, uh, you know, the relationship between the 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 ethnic Bulgarians and the ethnic Turks today is very good. But at the time, it was we did anything we could to undermine a communist regime. It was cold, full stop. Uh, you know, so fast forward to my next stint in the Balkans was as working for what is now the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, the, you know, it's the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the grandchild or the child of the Helsinki Accords. Uh, it's based out of Vienna and war was going on in Bosnia and Croatia and, and people were concerned it was going to spill over to Kosovo and some other places in the former Yugoslavia. So I got sent to, to run a mission that was kind of up, tucked in the Albania, Montenegro corner of, of Kosovo, a place called Pech, Peja today, uh, which is which is the home for the Serbian Orthodox churches. That's the seat of, 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 of the church. Uh, that was kind of my, my first experience of, okay, you know, I had a previous assignment where I was trying to light the powder keg of an ethnic conflict just to bring a regime down. Now I'm trying to now I'm trying to pull the fuse and prevent conflict. We were reasonably successful in preventing it, but I also knew when I left in 19, oh, 1993 in, in April, uh, it was inevitable what was going to happen there. Uh, the feelings between the Kosovo Albanians and the the uh, who are the majority in Kosovo and the minority Serbs in Kosovo, but obviously you know Albanians were a minority in, in in Serbia that what was then you know still Yugoslavia. Uh, was inevitably going to spill over into some kind of a full-scale war, which it did in uh, finally in 1999. At this point, we didn't have any American call it uh, building, you know, building, you know, security force assistance, uh, building partnership capacity. You know, we didn't have any allies in the region yet. Nobody was a member of NATO. This is all pre-accession. You know, basically, we're just trying to deter uh, conflict. We're trying to preserve life. That you know, kind of, I'm kind of running fast forward now is. That all changed, uh, you know. So then I had two years in in, in Belgrade, uh, Yugoslavia, dealing with Milosevic. My job then was to get the war in Bosnia stopped from at least you know at least get the Serbs out of supporting what the Bosnia Serbs were doing, which we eventually did with the help of Ambassador Richard Holbrook, uh, and eventually a couple you know ten, tens of thousands of NATO troops came in to enforce the Dayton Accords, blah 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 blah, and you know we we can talk about so how successful were we in a long-term solution? Uh, you know, my, my view is it was a short-term patch to stop the bleeding, you know, stop the shooting, uh, but it wasn't really good enough for a long-term solution. But now I'm down in Macedonia as U.S. ambassador in 2002, and we came very, very, very close. There, had, there was a conflict in the summer of 2001 um, that the U.S. and and other countries stepped in to stop between the Slavic majority Macedonians and the their their ethnic Albanian uh, minority, uh, where the the it, which was it was a spillover from Kosovo. Effectively, uh, it was a demonstration effect where the Macedonian military, which had been getting training from us, uh, both from conventional as, as well as special forces, the training hadn't taken. And the, the Macedonian conventional forces thought that they could reduce an insurgency using, you, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, they bought T-55 tanks from Ukraine. This is kind of like, you know, you know talk about, you know, back to the future right. and some used Su-25 fighter bombers. You know, tanks and, 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 and fast movers and drop bombs were somehow going to deal with an insurgency that was fighting up in the hills. It got to the point where we actually intervened and we brought the 10th Mountain Division down from Kosovo to basically get between the uh, the, the combatants, evacuated the, the ethnic Albanian fighters up to Kosovo, you know, got them out of harm's way, and then forced everybody to sit down. So the shooting stopped. Now we're all going to sit down. And now we've learned from, from, from Bosnia, uh, how do we, uh, you know, we're going to hammer something out where, where everybody thinks they got something, as opposed to feeling like it was shoved down their throat. There was a little bit of that, uh, but for the most part, you know, most they, they thought they had a good deal. Having said that, there were still some unresolved lingering issues. But at this point, we had changed how we were training the Macedonians. I think their military kind of woke up to counterinsurgency isn't one with, you know, with T-55 tanks, which God bless them, or or SU-25 fighter bombers. It, it, it you, you, you you win it by its hearts and minds. You know, it's 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 persuading the other guys. There's a seat for them at the table. 
and 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 we're going to be very careful about causing more harm when we go in and do an operation. And there, I'm going to credit the training uh, that we had some some teams that came in. That I distinctly recall this from 10th Special Forces Group via via Sakir at the time, who had spent time with specific units in the Macedonian military, really trying to educate them about you know the you know, they were shooting themselves in the foot, not they were not taking you know not taking care of business the way they were supposed to. So we had an incident that was manufactured uh, by some parties on both sides that really wanted to reignite the conflict because there were some people there like, well, it isn't over yet. You know, what, we haven't really won. You know, the outsiders, the Americans, the European Union have forced us to stop. We're going to settle this once and for all. And there was a standoff. Uh, at this point, we had a new government in place where we had great relationships with them, uh, both on the military, you know, mill to mill, as well as diplomacy. And this is where diplomacy links up with green suitors. Uh, and I get this phone call of like, uh, there's a standoff up in the hills. Uh, you know, the, the, the military is about to force its way through a group of villagers that are blocking a road. You know, villagers aren't, don't appear to be carrying guns, but the military is, and, and they're just going to do it. And, you know, and I knew right away what was going to happen next. Good news is grabbing my defense attache, grabbing a, a somebody else. We, you know, we, we zoomed up to the location, grabbed the minister of interior and his and the troops that were, they were all literally saddling up armored vehicles. They were going to, you know, crush their way up there. And it was going to be a bloodbath, probably on both sides. I actually think the mass, you know, the conventional forces were going to lose that one again because it was the wrong terrain. Mm -hmm. And we talked to them and we had enough of their officers and their, and at this point, NCOs who had learned and they decided to listen and says, okay, let's try talking to them and see if we can persuade them to step aside. And we did, and, and it worked. We went, we went together shoulder to shoulder. And this is before the country was in Macedonia, but that was a, an example where, where they didn't learn the lessons the first time around, even though we were offering it, but it was more of a conventional uh, security force assistance, which we switched over. It needs to be more tailored. You know, Macedonia doesn't need, did at the time, didn't need a conventional army, but it did need special operations. It did need that capability that understands people right. and, and how to reach it. So that, that was, you know, that was kind of like, wow, you know, like, you know, you know I, I did not see that coming, but I was extremely grateful. What I think is really interesting and in what you just said is, is this necessity and this need that we know often when we are in conflict zones that we as the you know US need and that that's that partnership between the the military and the the diplomats or the civilian and mi military relationship and it, it's so important and i i really like that you brought up the importance of that and and how that played out and actually worked to help stop a carnage or a bloodbath that, that, that may have well happened in that area. Could you just reflect on a few thoughts and maybe some lessons that you can, you learned then and continue to try to instill when you're working with other leaders um, to prepare for different deployments, different um, you know, I, I'm sure you work with dipl diplomats as well as military, but, you know, what do you instill in the military when they are deployed in different areas or go do rotations? And how important it is to value both that, that diplomatic effort that we have in the region and the military um, relationships and how that can, can benefit us more in the long run. Um, I, I have thought and written extensively about this, you know, since I retired from the State Department. Last time I left was it was 2016. And one of us is the amount of time that American diplomats spent working closely side by side with the American military, you know, both both, you know, conventional and special operations in places like Afghanistan and Iraq uh, and the Balkans. Uh, that was, you know, it, it, there was a there were a lot of positive lessons that came out of that. Uh, there was a lot of respect. Uh, the State Department community, for the most part, you know, they don't, most of them, very few of them have a military background. We have some prior military who joined the State Department, uh, but it's kind of kind of rare. And of course, we have Marine Security Guards and we'll have a defense attache office or an office of defense or military, you know, cooperation or security cooperation in the embassy. Uh, you know, but, you know, those are military diplomats. You know, they've all gone through schools about how to operate in an embassy. 
Um, but the, the positive lessons that were learned from 2000, you know, call it from 2000 and, you know, two, you know, starting in Afghanistan up until, uh, was it two summers ago or a summer ago when, when we, you know, we abruptly left Afghanistan and, you know, that relationship will, was very, very positive. I'd say most of the, of the senior diplomats in the state department and almost all of the, the, the flag and general officers who served in the, in those regions, spent got to know each other look i i, I one and I, i'm still annoyed by it one i'm I, look i'm up front i'm an army brat i was born in fort benning uh you know, i was a a Viet Cong role player for the special forces when i was 12 years old in fort bragg when i was you know just finishing you know seventh grade you know my dad was a counterinsurgency instructor so i and i was an rotc didn't get commissioned because you know the vietnam war ended uh, before I graduated, and they didn't need any more bullet chasing second lieutenants. But so I, I, I'm a little bit different in the sense of like I come to the military predisposed to you know people wearing green, you know are good. Uh, uh, people wearing blue, navy, the bad. You know, <laughs> my dad was a white <laughs> brother. You know, go army, beat navy. Uh, you know, I've had to overcome. I've had to overcome that yeah. over the years. <laughs> but then, but then, you know, the majority of the State Department people, you know, really come from a different background where they don't have exposure to the military. Uh, in fact, most Americans have no no exposure to the military, uh, given that something like you know two percent of the American population serves or you know or or lives near a base or you know it, it's something. Um, so I recall when I became ambassador in, in Macedonia and in, in, got there in January two thousand and two, and one of the first things I did was. To try to invite the 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 one star uh, first infantry division deputy commanding general who was up in Kosovo in a base literally right across the border from where I was. Hey, come on down, you know, have lunch with me. Let's talk, you know, because we have we share a border, we share the you know there were cross border stuff going on, and we needed to coordinate and stuff like that. And uh, boy, did I get the cold shoulder. It's kind of like not interested. You know, you're wasting my time. Uh, and I tried to you know, you know it, it took me a while to figure out kind of where that attitude came from. His successor, on the other hand, showed up and immediately accepted an invitation to come down for lunch. Uh, and, and he 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 fessed up uh, at the end of lunch. He says, "Hey, you know, the guy I replaced, my you know, he was the other de uh, deputy commanding general, uh, told me, you know, don't waste your time with the diplomats." And he says, he says, you know, I, and I don't understand that because, you know, I just, you know, the relationship that we built built that we built at, at that point became very productive. Uh, and, and it paid off because that was, you know, became Lieutenant General uh, Doug Lute, full, for, full General Doug Lute, who, you know, we we worked together on, on Afghanistan and Iraq later, you know, many years later. Uh, but that's the relationships that pay off uh, handsomely when we trust each other, we understand each other. The first one star, you know, he didn't have it in him. We didn't have the relationship as his successor did. But then the flip side of it is I've heard generals who, tried to deal with an American ambassador and they didn't get very far because somebody had a bad experience or a bad attitude. But it all comes down relationship uh, and understanding. So when I talk to uh, military audiences or, or groups that are going to go serve downrange, you know, one of the things I say is, hey, my goal in, in being here today is to help, help you to get the ambassador to yes, because the ambassador is the president's personal representative of his country. So unless you're in, like in a full up combat situation where you're not going to pay, you know, there isn't going to be an ambassador or you know the command command the, the four star commander with 150,000 troops is not really going to pay attention to ambassador Larry Butler uh, but you know those those places one aren't there aren't any places like that today uh and, and when there are they're few and far between is is sort of how you get me to yes how do you keep me from kicking you out of my country because i i can deny country clearance uh and and that's where you know being forthright being transparent uh being who you are uh, and then, you know, not getting into trouble in the country. My favorite current, current, so security force assistance, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a critiquer on this one. This is where ambassadors work well with each other. And, you know, this is something I'm very up, up front about. We didn't, we failed in Afghanistan. The evidence is there. Uh, we had mixed success in Iraq. Uh, the, the successes we should have had were taken away when we left in 2000, you know, at the end of 2011, uh, and then, you know, quite frankly, corruption and politics kicked in and the folks that we trained, you know, weren't there when Daesh came rolling down the, uh, uh, the Tigris uh, and the Euphrates almost got to, to, to Baghdad. It failed in Ukraine in 2014. 
you know, we had spent a lot of time working with the Ukrainian military to teach them tactics and how we, you know, you know how we organize and you know, how we fight. It was a wake up call for the for the uh, Ukrainians when, you know, Crimea was a walkover. I mean, they, they didn't see it coming, you know, Luhansk and you know, Donetsk and the other places out to the east. And then something funny happened. The Ukrainians woke up and said, maybe the Americans know what they're talking about. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can listen to them. And the big success was on the special operations side. You know, they, they pay attention. But the other big success was they bought into our concept of a, of a professional and non-commissioned officer corps, which is something that all the former Soviet militaries, Warsaw Pact militaries, didn't have sergeants. You know, their officers led from the front, which, you know, we've seen the results in Ukraine, how many generals have died because they don't have NCOs. Uh, so, it was, you know, I, that's one of the things I say is that, you know, our exa examples of successful American security force assistance that has paid off are few and far between. Many of the success stories you never read about. The good news is, the good news, nothing happened you know, because people were professional, did their jobs, and, you know, and, and things didn't erupt into a conflict. Uh, and the places where they failed, you know, where, you know, I'm certain, you know, all the billions of dollars we put in the Afghan National Army, you know, sort of, you know, that that disappeared. But, you know, there's there's uh, there were other problems there, too. The, 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 you know, difference between Ukraine is actually a country uh, with filled with people who are prepared to die for their country in Afghanistan was not the case. Uh, and, and, and we just didn't really understand that. And, and that's and I'm picking on that one because think of, you know, how many ambassadors and commanders did we have? In Iraq and Afghanistan over the 20 years that we were there. You know, some more, some teams more successful than others, to go back to your point about the relationship between commanding generals and the ambassadors. So some were much more definitely successful than others. I think one of the things that strikes me about Ukraine, and I mean, this may be, you know, we're or we as Americans are closer to European culture is that we also listened to the Ukrainians when they were asking for certain help, they were telling us they didn't need certain help. And, and then they were, you know, they actually, when they asked to come back, us to come back after 2014 and those, those times, we worked with them within their country very closely. So it wasn't just Americans telling Ukrainians, it was also Ukrainians Americans listening to feedback from Ukrainians about um, how how they needed to to look at the security of their own country. I I think that that's uh, a difference. But no, absolutely, and of course, in the case of Ukraine, you know, nothing nothing succeeds like success. You know, <laughs> as as their you know as as they have applied the tactics uh, that we had taught them, and they adapted it one to their own society, their own landscape and the conditions that they were fighting. Right. And then we could like see like, uh, okay, we can double down on this because you guys are succeeding here. And of course, you know, it, it's it, it's very public about, you know, no, we're not gonna give you tanks. We're not gonna give you, you know, F-16s or F-18s and stuff like that because, you know, that's not gonna help you right now. You know, what you need is artillery and lots of artillery mm -hmm. and, the, the means to, you know, the means to employ it, you know, and that was, you know, that was the success. Uh, you know, now we're into it. Now it's a different phase in the operation. You know, now it's like, okay, the Russians are still trying to, you know, press, press their advantage in, you know, in one part of the country. And Ukraine would like to, you know, retake all of it. Uh, and, and there it's going to be interesting enough. It's their country. At the end of the day, it's their decision. Uh, there are second and third order effects we always have to be very, very mindful of. I mean, last thing we're going to do is, you know, that you know we should do is you know, give them the means to like directly attack Moscow, and now we're now now we're risking a conflict, you, know, you know, an escalation that nobody desires. You know, but they have succeeded. Uh, people are paying attention. I suspect the demand for American security force assistance is going to go through the roof in a lot of other places right. based on this, but. Up until up until last year, I would say you know demand was like yeah you know give us the money, give us some toys, and you know don't tell us what to do because we don't think you're very good at it. Well, you know this is this is one where the golf pro you know has 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 created a bunch of Tiger Woods. Right, and I think right now you know we saw a drastic change because of this invasion. Right, we saw um, really a, re a revitalization of NATO, a new NATO strategy now. We also have a lot of um, Eastern European countries who've been waiting to enter the EU who are part of NATO that are are now um, 
having more robust talks about entering the European Union. And I think some of the ones we have already have relationships with because they are NATO members want closer relationships with us. Um, I hear that quite a bit from the, you know, my colleagues in Macedonia and Romania in particular, they seem to be looking to Croatia as a model that they want to replicate. And so they can not only be part of the European Union and NATO, but also get closer to the US um, and help the US to work through some of the extending conflicts that are still happening in the region. One that Macedonia, you, you know, um, in an earlier uh, talk that I saw that you gave talking about the Bulgaria issue with Macedonia because of language and because of a little bit of land as well. And so they're, they're trying to kind of bring that forward. And, um, you know, I'm just wondering in, in your discussions and your work so much for the military and knowledge as a diplomat, are there things the European Union or NATO can do to kind of quell some of these stirrings because Bulgaria has been blocking Macedonia for a long time in that case? And, or um, do you think that the, the US should work with the Europeans in a different manner in order to, to kind of say, you know, you need to put some of these grievances at a different level because we're gonna help you move forward in that security, that resilience and resistance space they want to be in right now well there's where the military cooperation security cooperation i has paid incredible dividends i mean one of the concepts this was uh george uh hw bush's you know europe whole free and at peace which then became you know the, the rallying cry uh for the clinton administration you know they picked up on that as well as is you know we, we you know with, with kind of the exception of greece and turkey over the years you know we haven't had nato, NATO allies go to war with each other and you know the combination of of of, of joint NATO or American-led exercises, you know, in the region, you know, have brought the the, the various militaries, the Macedon North Macedonian, uh, Bulgarian, Albanian, uh, even Serbian and Montenegrin uh, militaries. You know, you, getting them in the habit of knowing each other, working with each other, and then oh by the way, we're not going to you guys are going to go form a battalion. Uh, and 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 go off to do a peacekeeping mission someplace. Uh, that that has been ex extremely positive uh, uh, in my experience and my belief. And the European Union, as you know, has uh, its own European security and defense identity. Uh, it has its own Eurocorps, which I think is based out of Strasbourg. You know, it's you know it, its own military capability. Where sometimes they will they will go and do something which is not NATO related. Uh, the current peacekeeping force in in um, Bosnia is European Union led. Although I must have had a joke, you know, I, I had a joke at one point that the the original force that went in in nineteen ninety late nineteen ninety five early nineteen ninety six to separate the uh, the Bosnian Serbs from everybody else was called I four, right. which was short for the implementing force, which was then replaced by S force, which was the stabilization force which was then replaced by U4, you know, the European force. And then my joke, because I spent two years, uh, 95 to the, uh, 2005, 2007, working for, you know, for the United Nations uh, there, was the next iteration should be what for, because you know, it was kind of a question of, you know, why are you guys still here? Well, good news is, is you know, they, I'm glad they're still there. Uh, NATO is, K4 is still a NATO operation in Kosovo. So we have two... Oh, and this is kind of reminding you of, of the UN is still present on the island of, of Cyprus, keeping you know Greeks and Turks, you know Cip Greek Cir Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots apart, and that's been like fifty years now. So it's kind of like some of these things are, are you know the never-ending tale. You know how do you how do you finally get away with it? But to get back to to Macedonia and Bulgaria and Bulgaria right now make, making throwing up roadblocks and making it difficult for the Macedonians to join the European Union, and, and you know again. The history goes back several hundred years and it goes back to, you know, sort of like, who's your daddy? You know, you, know, you guys are really, you're really Bulgarians. Your language is really Bulgarian. Your church is really Bulgarian. Your history is really Bulgarian. You, you know, we share the same king, uh, Cyril and Metodi, you know, you know the, the Cyrillic language you know, was developed by one of the 
a monk who the Bulgarians will tell you that he's Bulgarian, the Macedonians will tell you he's Macedonians. I'm not sure what the Greeks have to say about it, but he wasn't, they, they weren't speaking Greek, but they were using, a, a, you know, their, their script was uh, you know, derived from Greece, obviously. The idea that we had, uh, Lord Patty Ashdown, my boss in Bosnia, talked about the, you know, the magnetic pull of, of Brussels translation, joining NATO, joining the European Union, would overcome the centrifugal forces of nationalism. There is a great book, uh, Chris Clark, uh, The Sleepwalkers, which deals with you know, basically, you know, the, basically how we got into World War I, sleepwalking into it, the famous expression. And the first 100 pages is just horrific uh, about the atrocities committed by you know, each and every everybody in that particular region, which led to the great powers getting involved, which led to World War I. The fault lines are still there. Uh, kind of the good news is, and I love this Croatia example, is you know, Slovenia kind of graduated from the Balkans. You know, nobody thinks of Slovenia as a Balkan country anymore. Right. Or, or Croatia too, sometimes. Well, and, and, and Croatia is is now, uh, well, it's been part of the European Union for a while, but it just joined Schengen, which means visa-free travel inside. And it's just it's just gotten rid of the Kuna uh, and replaced it with the, with the Euro. So they are now 100% in, integrated into the European Union, just like Slovenia. Uh, which means they've effectively graduated from, you know, they're in, they're technically in Southeast Europe, but they're not really in the Balkans anymore. Uh, Montenegro, NATO member, not European Union yet. Albania, NATO, not European Union. Uh, Bosnia, neither. Macedonia, NATO, but not European Union. So, you know, we've, we haven't filled in the pieces of the puzzle of Europe, whole, you know, free and at peace yet. And the, the problem I've got there is, is the Russians are playing games, uh, just stirring the pot, uh, as the as the Austro-Hungarian Empire did, as the French did, as the British did, as the Turks did, as the as everybody did between 1876 and, and uh, 1914, uh, when Archduke Ferdinand got shot in Sarajevo, and you know, the, as they say, the rest was history. Um, so they're the they're diplomats working hand in hand with American. NATO and European Union, the, the, call it the, I call it the three pieces coming together. Uh, when they mesh, they bring, they, they bring stability, they bring security, uh, and, they, they, and they give space for politicians to you know, duke it out in the public arena. Uh, so far, and this is one, one thing I was here right now, uh, this is the first time in a while that literally every ambassador in the every American ambassador in the Balkans has served there before. It's been a while. The Balkans was kind of a place. To, you know, being a look, being an ambassador that I speak from, you know, one of the knows is you know, you, you, towards the end of your career, you know, they make you an ambassador. You're one and done. It's your it's your gold watch. You know, and, and please go away and stop bothering us. And you can call yourself ambassador for the rest of your life. So we had a lot of people that had never served in Europe, and this was their chance to serve in Europe. And then they discovered that they're ambassador in a in a country they don't speak the language, don't don't understand the history of the culture. Uh, and, but they're good. I mean, they, they you know they, they've earned the right to be there. They just don't have they don't bring anything specific to the country. They bring other experience. But now we have people who bring the other experience, but they also bring the, the linguistic skills. Uh, they know the people. Uh, a good example is you know current ambassador to to uh, Belgrade is you know is is a close relationship to the president of uh, of Serbia, Vucic. Buc uh, that relationship you I, you cannot overestimate. Uh, the importance of that, of being able to communicate, which means next piece of it is, so what's the relationship with the U.S. military? Is that uh, when I was in charge of the embassy in Belgrade in 1995, the, the, the NATO commander that used to fly in, he was an American admiral, four star, uh, came out of what used to be AF South, Allied Forces South, which is now Joint Forces Command, Naples. He wouldn't come to the embassy. He wouldn't meet with me. It took me three times that he flew in to go do his thing as NATO before he, there was an agreement that I could go to the airport and I could get on board his airplane and we, I could give him a quick 15 minute briefing before he went off and did his, his mano a mano NATO to the, you know, the Yugoslavia, the JNA forces, mm -hmm. uh, but took a while to develop that relationship where he would trust me. Uh, and one of the problems is you're an American NATO commander, which means you today you have 30 countries that you represent. You, the American ambassador cannot be first among amongst equals, you know, even despite the fact that he's got an American patch, American flag patch here, and I'm the American ambassador. Uh, and when I worked for the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, and we made the rounds, it was the same problem. 
you know, we're not going to go to the American embassy, but, you know, we're going to reach out to you and give you an opportunity you know, out of sight. Nobody sees it to have that interaction with the American four star to develop that relationship because you know, it's too late. You know, you can't search trust. You, you know, as they say, you, you, you don't go to the war with the army you have. You go to war with the army, the, with the army you want. You go to war with the army you have. When you need a relationship you know, and when the balloon goes up, either you have it or you don't have it. It's too late to create it. Well, those diplomatic and military relationships and engagement are so important to have aligned. Even, um, you know, I mean, I know there are, there are some competing thoughts, but it's so important for them, again, to be aligned for reasons you were stating earlier. You know, you, you can then stop the road to war. You know, the battle best one is won before it starts. Mm -hmm. So to, you know, I just... Part of, part of this is going to lead me to another question because I can go off and start talking about that because I'm very passionate about our government agencies working together um, because I've seen too many instances where that sabotaged a lot of our own national interests. But in in Eastern Europe in particular, we, we've kind of taken time back. We've stepped back after the 90s a little bit and let the Europeans kind of take the lead. And I, I think that some of our partners there felt like you're laughing at me, <laughs> felt like we had not been 100% there for them as they would have wanted us to, especially um, a lot of the, the military officers that I have been speaking to and talking to throughout the region. Um, and now I think that that's shifting. Um, I guess my question would be, we Eastern Europe has always been a very central East West location. It's you know world wars have started there. Another one is is you know really on the brink. How can we really Im Im put an imprint on our our government that we really need to stay engaged and 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 um, be aware of what's happening there and and make sure our policy you know, particularly is aligned and aligned well from having to revert back. Now, we already have one conflict that's brewing in Ukraine that really needs to, ha has has the possibility of enlarging. We've talked about that a bit. So what, what are your thoughts on continued American en engagement and maintaining that engagement, both diplomatically and militarily? Or, or is, it, is it just a, you know, military special force engagement because perhaps we don't need to be there at any larger footprint than that. I have lost track of how many times in my career I heard the words pivot to the Pacific. <laughs> you know, Europe is done, you know, especially after 1991, the wall falls, Soviet Union is gone, Cold War is over, you know, peace has descended on the continent, you know, you know, it's Francis Fukuyama, you know, uh, end of history, you know, it's, you know, it's liberal, demo liberal democracy in the sense of like our kind of democracy is, is prevailed and we've reached the top, you know, there's, there's nowhere to go, unfortunately, except down. Uh, and, you know, Henry Kissinger once famously asked when somebody said, well, you know, sort of, you know, you know let, let the Europeans take care of it. And his answer was, you know, Europe, what's its phone number? And this is, this is before they developed, you know, the, the European External Action Service Headed up by Stefano Stefanini, which who, whom I knew once upon a time when he was an Italian embassy officer uh, working with me in the Balkans, uh, and we have we have periodically taken our eyes off the ball, uh, let the Europeans lead, not fully understanding that the great power rivalries of 1880s, 1890s into you know 1913 haven't totally dissipated. Uh, yeah, one of my favorite stories is if you walk into Whitehall, the British Foreign and Commercial uh, uh, Commonwealth Office uh, in, in London, um, there's a mural of Britannia and she's got her, her hands up over, over two figures underneath it. One is Mark Belgium, meaning you know, Britain has always looked after Belgium, think World War I, World War II, and the other one was Serbia. Uh, and my biggest rival when I was in... When I was when I was in uh, in Belgrade ninety four to ninety five, I realized my British counterpart uh, was very very cozy with not just the the local Serbs, you know the Yugoslav Serbs, but with the Bosnian Serbs too. 
Uh, it's kind of funny. I had I had my source for that one was what you know, I will trust me. I, you know, when 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 I when I die and go to hell, you know, Milosevich is going to be waiting for me, and a lot of my friends are going to be waiting for me. But uh, uh, I was it, an officer in the Anglican Church uh, in Belgrade, and there was a an Australian Anglican chaplain who was basically assigned to the British Embassy, and who lived in the gatehouse of the British ambassador's residence. And on Sunday morning, uh, after I've been there for a year, he started briefing me on who would turn up at the British ambassador's house on s Saturday evening. And I asked him finally, he says, why are you telling me this stuff? And he says, you know, you're like, you're assigned to the British embassy. You're like, you know, you're, you're an attache, you're a chaplain. And he goes, you know, he says, Larry, you know that no, nobody from the British embassy comes to church. <laughs> Like it's, it's it's basically eight Americans plus some Africans and plus some other foreigners. And it's just so um, I thought you'd want to know. Like oh thank you. Uh, so yeah, you know, and and likewise, you know, Germany lit the match for you know helped light the match for the war, uh, the breakup of Yugoslavia by prematurely recognizing Croatia when Croatia uh, uh, declared its independence. Yeah, there was there was no hesitation. There was no European solidarity. Germany says we recognize you, and like as I said, the rest was history. And at the time, Germany wasn't allowed to send its troops outside of Germany. You know, their constitution forbid it. You know, so, so it's equivalent of I'm going to light the match, but I, but I'm not allowed to put the fire out. Uh, now a lot has changed since then. So a lot of that old historical things are still there. The good news is, is we've just had a very senior, the number three guy in the State Department, Derek Scholle, uh, has now made paid two trips to the region to uh, demonstrate American commitment and interest. Uh, of course, you know, Tony Bl Secretary Blinken was just in, you know, in in Israel and Palestine. It would be great if Tony had some time to go to uh, Belgrade and 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 uh, uh, Tirana and and uh, uh, Pristina and, and some of the other spots as well. But you know, he, you know, he's one person, and there's there's bigger problems in the world than that one. But it was good that that that, that the Council of the State Department Chile was was able to go there. The European Union has stepped it up in terms of engagement to have an enhanced dialogue. Uh, but again, I you know, my you know my concern is is probably a, it's a little too European heavy and not you know not balanced enough uh, on the American side. Having said that, you just heard me say that, you know, with last summer's, this summer's uh, turnover of ambassadors and, and, and the most recent announcement of who's going to uh, uh, Romania, we now have people who've served in, the, in those countries, not just the region, countries before. Uh, so we're going to have amped up American presence uh, with, with, you know, built in relationships. And, you know, and, and I think that that bodes well. The next question, and this is where I don't have a lot of visibility, is so what is the the, you know, the American dip diplomatic military engagement relationship, you know, how robust is it? Uh, I know uh, General Kaboli at, at U.S. European Command, uh, as well as the commander of, you know, Special Operations Command, they do spend a lot of time engaging with, you know, the diplomats because, you know, they have convening power. Mm -hmm. uh, General Kaboli covers 40 countries, or 40 to 45 countries, who make, makes up Europe. Uh, and he's in the region, you know, it's, it's a, you know, you know there isn't a, a place that's, that's further than two hours away from where he's, where he's situated. If he was in Stuttgart, Brussels is a little further away. Uh, so he, he, okay. he's present, he's visible, he's on the ground. And I know the ambassadors are, uh, are, are frequently up in Stuttgart meeting, meeting their counterparts, developing those relationships. I don't know on the, on the European Union side, how that works. The, the most funny story I had was, in order for me to work uh, for the, this office of the high representative, this UN affiliated organization in Bosnia, I had to resign from the State Department in order to be an, an international civil servant for two years. And my boss was Lord Patty Ashdown, passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, and he was the, so he's the international community's representative, but the European Union needed to have its own representatives. So they dual hatted him. They also made him the European Union special representative. And it was an informal office. He had no staff. Basically, he just drew on the office of the high representative staff. And I was his deputy. He turns to me one day and says, you're now the deputy EU special representative. And they go, great. And he goes, what does that mean? He says, well, I, you know, I have to brief once a quarter to the, um, uh, the, the, the political security uh, council of the European Union in Brussels. I can't go this, I can't, I can't make the next one. You're going to represent me. You're going to go and be the act, you know, and you're going to speak on behalf of the European Union. I went, that's the damnedest thing I've ever heard. I walked in the room 
you know, to do, do the presentation. I knew half of the European Union ambassadors up in Brussels, they'd seen me in other, in other, other incarnations. And afterwards, one of them come up with it and says, you're the deputy EUSR? <laughs> he goes, I go, yeah. He says, uh, the Americans have just taken over the EU. And I says, well, that wouldn't, <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad thing. But no, actually, I'm not actually working for the State Department because you know, I work for, I work, actually work for you guys right now. Uh, I work for all of you, uh, good stuff like that. But that cross, the cross fertilization and, and meshing and linking is what's going to succeed. We can't, it can't be just EU by itself. Uh, it can't be just the United States by itself, and it can't be just NATO or 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 others, because you still have Turkish interest in the region. The Russians obviously have this. I don't know if you know it. There's like a hundred. There's more than a hundred thousand Russians who have left Russia in the last twelve months and are living in Serbia. To avoid I mean, the draft. I well, I mean, I mean, I, they're all over the place, but I you know, there's, there's like you know, and oh, by the way, it's like the tech savvy Russians. You know, so, you know, there's there's a brain drain that left Moscow and they've settled in Serbia, which is good news for Serbia, because these are you know people that are actually employed, making money, working remotely like, you know, like everybody after COVID, you know, but the uh, but the risk for something going sideways because somebody and this is where social media, you know, artificial intelligence and algorithms and, and disinformation are just at play big time. And you know something is not a lot that diplomats or military can do uh, to counter disinformation in a region where disinformation rules. Uh, the Open Society Initiative you know, did a study. Uh, you've probably seen it. Uh, they talked about you know uh, media literacy. You know the Scandinavians are off the scale with knowing bullshit when they see it. Uh, the people down in the Balkans believe everything they read. Well, I mean, they you know they've been closed off for a really long time, and and they've been living kind of in their own bubble for a very long time. So, it's kind of I I remember in Albania in the nineties, just we, you know the Americans were going to build a tunnel under Lake Ohrid. <laughs> that was the big thing that was going on there, <laughs> which I was really surprised about because I thought nobody found the bottom of Lake Ohrid ever. So how are they going to build the tunnel? But <laughs> Nonetheless, this was the big rumor that was going around. <laughs> well, when we when we built a new American embassy in Skopje, the rumor oh. was that we there was a tunnel that went up to Kosovo. And <laughs> I, I was like, Albanians like tunnels. <laughs> you know, well, everybody was convinced that it was, and it was it was secretly how we were. You know, and and I remember asking somebody. This was I had, I had left by that by that time, but I asked one of my Macedonian friends, and says, "And it remind me again, the purpose of the tunnel is." Yes, you know, with helicopters and airplanes. Well, that, and you know, I guess the same holds true for that tunnel going under Lake Ohrid. <laughs> because at that time, Albanians could just go across the bridge, right? So. Well, conspiracies, you know, Americans love conspiracy theories, but nobody loves a conspiracy theory more than the people in the Balkans. And part of it's because some of them are not conspiracies. I mean, you know, they were not theories, they were realities. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was uh, indeed, you know, somebody's plotting to do this or planning to do that. And, uh, uh, and when you live in, in a world where you're constantly, constantly looking over your shoulders, and one of the things to keep in mind about the Balkans, the reason why Balkans is, you know, it's a powder keg, you know, there's powder in it, there's a fuse, there's, there's various actors who would like to light it just to cause, to cause problems for us, not because they have any ambitions there. It's just, it'll be a distraction, it'll, you know, it's wedge driving, uh, distract us from other things and things like that one is because of the crucial location of the Balkans. Almost all of the air routes from Western Europe down to the Middle East fly over Belgrade. The Danube River flows past Belgrade, and all the land and rail routes go through Belgrade. I mean, it is, you know, it, it is the choke point between Europe and, and Asia Minor. Yes, and I, I'm glad you really brought that up because, again, it goes back to Europe and Eastern, this part of the region, this part of the world being central to so many crossroads. Um, and, you know, for me, the concept of not paying attention to that is mind boggling. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, well, let's, let's, the, this, go ahead. Let's go back to that one. So you know, one of the things you said early on in, in this conversation uh, was, you know, thanks to Ukraine, you know, NATO has a reason to exist. You know, has a new strategic <laughs> concept. You know, two, two years ago, you know, I'll be honest. NATO was you know, a, you know, a bureaucratic organization looking for a reason to to exist. And five years ago, maybe six years ago, 
We had a man who was running for president who actually called into question uh, the sanctity of Article 5 of, of the Washington Treaty, the NATO Treaty, which is an attack on one is, is to be considered a, you know, an attack on all, uh, which led to three countries in Europe, France, Germany, and, and, and England. Uh, the defense ministers began quietly talking to each other about creating a new triple entente, if I can you know, kind of go back to uh, World War I. Uh, because there was a concern on the part of Europe that the United States was going to walk away from Europe and walk away from its NATO treaty obligations. That, you know, it was it was seen as a real possibility. Well, you know, it's kind of, you know, the coin has flipped over, but the one thing Europeans and the rest of the world have paid attention to us is, are we willing to sustain our presence and our engagement and our involvement? Uh, you know, we left we left Iraq once, twice, uh, you know, we're kind of, we're still there. Uh, you know, the Syria thing is like, what are we going to do? What are we not going to We have Obama's famous red line of, over the chemical weapons, which, you know, sort of, you know, the Russians snatch victory from the jaws of, uh, of defeat uh, from us on that one. You know, don't draw red lines unless you're planning to, to do it. Uh, we, the mess, the mess we, you know, we got into Libya. Uh, you know, are, are we a reliable ally? Can you count on us being there? And at my time when I was at US European Command and in, uh, in 2020, you know, 2011 to 20, 2013, the first armor division went home. Uh, another brigade went home and we closed bases all over Germany. Um, you know, it was basically, we were closing up shop. You know, it was the American presence was, 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 was down to almost nothing. Uh, you know, people, you know, the Europeans and other folks took, took notice. Um, well, that has changed. And but the bubble, the bubble over over policymakers' heads is is this a permanent change or is it a the pendulum swinging? That's what I wanted to get your thoughts on. And I think you know I don't I know that we discussed a time frame, so I'll just I'll ask you one last cl last question then. So what do we need to do policy wise to keep this engagement going? And, and the, what keeps you up at night <laughs> in this area of the world? <laughs> So oddly enough, the things that keep me up at night is not specifically in this area of the world. It's it's the 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 other Russian periphery that that the Russians have taken their eyes off of. Uh, uh, Nagorno Karabakh, uh, you know, Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, right now, the 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 Azerbaijanis are 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 choking off uh, the remaining Armenian uh, population in Nagorno Karabakh. You know, and they're going to finish off you know what they started you know a couple of years ago. Because the Russians aren't there anymore, and then there's a bunch of of Central Asian countries that have unresolved uh, border issues that the Russians used to keep in check because of their presence and and and, and their political influence. But again, they're distracted; they're not paying attention right now. Uh, so th there's potential for for flares out there. Uh, uh, they're going to that will cause problems on on the Russian periphery, uh, which will you know be un which will have second and third order effects for us. But what keeps me up at night is the you know the prospect. Uh, the Russians tried really hard over the last three years to light the to light the fuse, and, and happily it, it it either went out or or we helped put it out. One was when, when Montenegro was on the in the process of acceding to NATO. I mean there were riots, there were protests. Uh, Belgrade was involved. The Russians were involved. Macedonia ditto. As it was, as it was going through the agony of agreeing to change its name for the third time in a short history, uh, to to cut a deal with Greece, uh, the Russians whipped up nationalist sentiment in the country, and there were riots and there were protests. Happily, that all subsided. They got through it, uh, and it was all done through uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You know, V contact all the social media outlets. Uh, Plus, probably the presence of, of Russian intelligence agents. Uh, uh, they have a, a base in niche called the, the you know the Serbian Russian Humanitarian Centers, uh, which you know presumably is you know there's probably not very man, many humanitarian workers there. I'm sure they have other jobs uh, you know in their spare time, uh, just looking to, to cause problems. Uh, Kosovo is what keeps me up at night because the Albanians are very determined. Usually pretty patient. You know, they're kind of like, you know, the, you know, you call them the Chinese of Europe. You know, they take the long view because they've been there you know, longer than I think anybody else. Uh, but they can also be prone to, okay, now, you know, making decisions that are 
in retrospect, rash, you know, why now? But they would like to control all of their territory, but they've got this significant Serbian population in the northwestern corner up around uh, Mitrovica who do not want to be part of Kosovo. Uh, and, you know, we've got NATO troops there, K-4 still there. Uh, Kosovo has got a security force and you've got Serbian military up there. Uh, President Vucic uh, last year talked about uh, over, over New Year's, uh, there was a flare up over license plates. And he, you know, he, you know, he announced that he was going to ask NATO for permission to send his own troops in, you know, to take care of problems. Well, you know, and that I don't... was a tit for tat conflict. Basically, they were mad that the Serbians made them put on license plates. So the Kosovo's, I mean, it's just like this back and forth with if you have to put on a blue shirt, then I have to put, you know, then you have to put on a blue shirt if I have to put one on too, you know, and so. Yeah, I mean, little little things like that. Are, it, 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 does, it would not take much. Right. Well, it did take much, right, to spark World War One, right? It didn't. It, no. it took, well, it, 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 it was. Because everything else was already going on behind the scenes, I guess. There was lots of other things, and it was a trigger. It was a w very well-crafted, very well-hatched uh, plot, which, by the way, almost didn't succeed. Uh, you know, Archduke Ferdinand, you know, deserved what he got because, you know, the intel was there that there was an assassination plot. You know, there was a failed attempt to throw a bomb. Uh, he'd actually been sort of shot at once, and he kind of kept going. You know, his you know his secret service didn't say, "Hey, you know, now's would be a really good time to get off the you know get out of this open vehicle, you know, and not drive across this bridge." You know, that was just dumber than rocks. But yeah, it does. It would not take much. Uh, good news is, and you know, Russia's got bigger things to do than actually employ military force in the Balkans. That's good news. Uh, question is, is would somebody in one of the capitals think that we're distracted by what's going on in Ukraine and that we might not react to something that happens in the Balkans and it gets out of hand? That's what keeps me up at night. It's it's a miscalculation. And I watched I watched people miscalculate there all of the time. And this is where me as a diplomat. General Cavoli, US, you know, the commander of US Euro, uh, European Command, or any of his subordinate folks that go down there, we can we can help people walk back from don't make this mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw, you know, I saw General George Jawan when he was sack here, you know, look Slobodan Milosevic in the eye, uh, you know, in, in 95, 96, you know, it, 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 or it was you know, it, and kind of let him know what was going to happen. And things were really well. Fast forward three years later, and he he didn't he didn't appreciate the warning we gave him about what would happen to him if he would if he did what he did to Kosovo. He went ahead and did it anyway, despite what we told him not to. So that was a miscalculation, and I, that that that's what keeps me up at night. What doesn't keep me up at night is that we have just an incredible incredible array of American diplomats down there, uh, U.S. European Command, you know, and and Special Operations Command and NATO are fully present, fully aware. European Union is still the European Union. It's got what was it down to twenty seven members? You know the twenty seven members that you know they do have you know they have their own collective body. They've got Stefano uh, Sanini, uh, Sanino as 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 the as their equivalent of the foreign ministry of it. They've got an enhanced dialogue. Um, the place, but the place that does keep me up at night is is Bosnia because Dayton was good enough to stop a war. It was not good enough to create a country, and you still have three factions that would kind of like. Two would love to go their own way, and the third one wants to keep everybody in, and and that's that's the hard part. And again, there's just there's too much there's too much dry dry kindling there, and too and too many people with matches, you know, looking up if I just put it here. Uh, so Dodik doing a snap decision next month to call, and he says he's not going to do it, but to call a referendum on independence, all hell's going to break loose. Ooh, I hope that that doesn't happen. But on that note, I hope we're paying attention is what I'm going to say right there, because sometimes that's what worries me. Sometimes that, that it, it's what uh, some people refer to the gray rhino. It's right there in front of you, but you're not paying attention to it. Right. <laughs> so it's like, why can't I see it? No, I hope we're paying attention. <laughs> I'm comforted on my end to see that you're out advising and I, I am so glad that you continue to do that. I hope that in the future I can join you at some point. Um, but I want to thank you so much for spending your time today with me. I hope that we can have another conversation in a couple months that is a little different than this. I hope it's not that last uh, idea that you left us with in Bosnia, but 
I, I if if I I would have to agree that that that's probably what concerns me most right now in the region. So anyway, well, JSL thanks you, and I look forward to next time. Mm -hmm. Thank you.